Cool. So, guys, um, thank you very much for checking in today's event. It's a, uh, it's a masterclass that we started doing on a monthly basis. So it's really great to see you all here. Um, this particular event is called Act Now Consumer and Eco-Friendly Brands. Now, I know you're probably thinking, why are we doing this event? And the, the reason is simple, really. When I started Gramercy, I had no idea the amount of eco-friendly products that are launching on a yearly basis. Clearly, it's what the customers want. Um, loads of entrepreneurs are coming up with some great ideas. And I would say that probably within the region of 80 to 90% of what we cover is eco-friendly in some regard. Um, so that's really positive because obviously global warming is on the up and uh, hopefully it's startups will be pushing it right back down again. So this event is just in association with uh, the Brand Bean. The Brand Bean are a global market research company. Um, so we're really great, uh, grateful to work with them. Hilary Strong will be taking over this session very shortly. So I'm your host. <clears throat> My name is George Taylor and um, I set up Gramercy in late July, early August last year. And in case you don't already know who we are, I, I know that most people do um, by now, but in case you don't know, you can check us out at gramercy.com. We are a digital publisher and we specialize in consumer and retail startup news video content and events like this sadly we've got a pandemic on i mean i'd much rather be here having a glass of fizz with a lot of you but uh that's not going to happen <laughs> until this till this thing passes so meanwhile we'll have to just cope with doing it virtual as we've all got used to it anyway right so um, before i move on to hillary I just, to, I, I just want to start by saying thank you to everybody i mean um everyone has supported us so much and i'm just i'm just so hugely grateful i mean this business is, is on its way to great success and there's no way that would be possible without you guys doing what you do. Um, some of our key highlights this month is we've just started to get a lot of celebrities involved recently. So Levi Roots was the first one. He's filming some video content for us. We do have a few more on the way, but I'll keep that top secret right now. Um, this month, we've had our biggest traffic by far, by a long shot, come off to a cracking start to the year. So that's obviously brilliant. <clears throat> um, and also, we're already getting a few thousand hits. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how, we, how we've achieved that, considering we're not even going six months yet, but it's brilliant. It's great. Super grateful about that. Um, and we've worked with some amazing brands so far. I mean, to be honest with you, the list is endless. I can't name them all, otherwise we'd be here all day. But some of them are War Paint for Men, um, who was offered an investment on Dragon's Den, which I think he turned down at the end, actually. Uh, Posey Yoga, the overnight yoga sensation that was featured in British Vogue one month after launching. Insane stuff, crazy stuff. Uh, Milk Plus, that's Camilla Ainsworth, who was on, I think, the last season or the season before The Apprentice, and she's, she was one of the finalists. And Dr. Tara Lalvani, um, my personal favourite, who is Tage from Dragon's Den's wife, launched this unbelievable makeup box. Best thing I've ever seen. It's incredible. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you go on Google, check it out right now. Um, last but not least, we're also in talks with some really cool like networks, like sustainability networks, eco-friendly networks, global startup communities, so you can push the Gramercy brand out there and build our readership. So thank you for supporting us. Really appreciate it. And I hope you'll continue to do so. If you haven't followed us already, Google us, Gramercy, find us, follow us. We'd really appreciate it. And also, if you do um, want to get in touch with us, our email is info at gramercy.com. And Hillary's email is down there too. That's if you've got any questions for her regarding the substantial case study she's put together, that's the place to go. Right, moving on to our actual event. Now that I've finished rabbiting on about, about what we do. Uh, so Hillary Strong. As I said earlier, she's the founder of The Brand Bean. They're a global market research company with a strong presence in the UK, Spain, and Argentina. Um, she's worked with brands like Unilever. Again, it's a long list, not gonna go into all of them. And as an agency, The Brand Bean typically explores hot topics. Um, and I think, as I said earlier on, the eco-friendly space is definitely a hot topic right now. And Hillary is at the forefront of that with a brand new case study, which she will be talking about in the next few seconds. So just bear with me while I uh, unshare my screen. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, George. And, and thank you to George and to Gramercy for inviting me to talk this morning. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, as George said, I run the Brand Bean. And, and one of the things we do is we like picking topics that we're just really nosy and curious about. Um, and this one is a piece of work that we've been doing over the last six months that is definitely in that box. Um, so what I wanted to do this morning was just share, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, no more, um, and just share the highlights of this piece of research that we did in October. 
Um, this research, there's about a 40 page PDF that goes with this. I am really happy to send that to anybody. It's downloadable. I can either put the link in the chat or I can follow up afterwards. The point of this exercise was to make some information available and for people to be able to access it and use it. So um, I'm just gonna pick out a couple of those slides today, but like I say, I'm really happy to share that openly afterwards. And, and again, forward it on if you find it interesting. Um, the piece of work we did was back in October. We ran this um, study with about 4,200 consumers in the UK from right across the UK and really, really strong um, age differences as well. So we're really confident that it's really representative. Um, and I'll just take the chance to say thanks to the four brands that partnered with us on this work, which is Dame, Small, Tea Pigs and True Foods. Um, and what we really set out to do, as I said, I'm, I like exploring things and my thought with this one was, we all know that consumers want to do more in the eco-friendly space. We know that consumers are saying they want to do more, they want to buy more eco-friendly products, but we also know there's a really big gap. So often you, you'll hear that talked about as the value action gap. So that difference between what we say we wanna do and actually what we're doing. Um, and often that value action gap has been laid at the door of consumers. You know, so the media often will have us believe that consumers, when it comes to it, don't either want to change their habits or they can't afford to change their habits. They're not willing to make an effort. Um, so that's kind of been the narrative over the last few years. And with this work, myself and the partners wanted to find out if that was really true um, and what was really kind of what might be the other things that are getting in the way between what people want to do and what they actually do do. Um, so the first thing to say is people do want to change. We know that, yeah? So the work that we did showed consumers rated being more eco-friendly as 8.8 8 out of 10. So that's to say that a ton of people want to buy more eco-friendly brands and products. 78% say it's more important to them than versus a year ago. So we know this is a really big issue, okay? That, that kind of isn't, isn't in itself isn't different. I think one of the things that we saw in this study was there's definitely been a shift in the depths to which people are feeling that desire. So I think before we heard consumers say, yeah, I really want to do more to help the environment. I want to change. What we found in this work is, I think that's shifted up a gear and I think we've reached a tipping point where the consumers we spoke to feel compelled to do something. I think there's a feeling now that climate change um, and the environment are such big issues now and on such a world scale. And the media have played a really important role in creating that sort of sense of, of urgency, I think, amongst consumers. But consumers are now saying, I need to feel like I am part of the solution. I have to feel like I'm somehow contributing. Um, and again, I think that's, that's really important because another narrative that we often hear is consumers can't make a difference, you know, switching into out of plastic cotton buds won't make any difference and actually I think that's a really dangerous narrative I think it's really important that consumers recognize that they have got power that every single category that they're buying into makes a difference because when you put some of those numbers together you get millions of people shifting things um, so I think it's really important that consumers feel like they're being empowered and feel like brands are motivating them and enabling them to make more positive choices. Um, and that's what they're doing. So that value action gap is really starting to shift now. So some of the data we've got, 83% of consumers, and as I said, this is more than 4,000 consumers, 83% of them said that they've switched brands or habits in the last year to be more eco-friendly. And 53% are trying brands and products that they previously wouldn't have considered. So I think for anybody who's running a brand or working in kind of marketing or sales, this is really important because this is now saying consumers are acting on their values, they're making different choices, and they're really willing to make an effort to find more sustainable options. Um, so I'm not going to go through them on here, but we asked in the study, we asked consumers, okay, so you've told us that you're willing to make changes. What, what have some of those changes been? And they reeled off a list of just innumerable categories. So 
whether it's switching energy provider to switching back to cloth nappies, um, giving up cling film, making their own hummus instead of buying it. You know, each of those, when you read them in isolation, you might kind of go, oh, that's, you know, that's a tiny thing. But what I mean is when you put that back into millions, you start to get the, the potential for really powerful change. Um, and all of those examples are just demonstrate consumers being willing to spend a little bit more, do some research, shift in their shopping habits around. So lots of people talked about no longer depending on their single weekly shop at Tesco, that, you know, the combination of the growth in online shopping, direct to consumer models, um, and also the pandemic and, and kind of how we're all having to live have really accelerated people's movement towards much more disparate shopping. So tons of examples about people going to buy, buy back in smaller stores, more independent stores, local stores, and people are really willing and they're much more able now to split that shop. Um, whereas perhaps 10 years ago, they did 95% of their shopping at one big retailer. I haven't got the data on this, but my hunch from what we've seen here is that that's going to shift down and people are starting to, to pepper and separate their shopping out in order to be able to buy more eco-friendly products. But there is still a gap. So what I'm saying here is our evidence shows that there's a real need and a kind of a desire from consumers to get involved in taking action. More and more of them are doing that across multiple categories but they're still saying there's a real gap in terms of how easy it is to buy and to find more eco-friendly and more sustainable products. Um, so why the gap, you know? So if eight, if they're saying it's 8.8 .8 out of 10 for importance, but only 5.9 for ease, then there's, there's something kind of not working there. So what we kind of uncovered in this is, there's four really big barriers that are continuing to kind of to hold consumers back. Um, and again, as often is the case in, in marketing, you know, a lot of this isn't rocket science. The biggest barrier is understanding. Um, and this is where consumers are saying, I still don't always understand which products are more eco-friendly, genuinely more eco-friendly. And I'm gonna come on and talk about big brands in a minute, but greenwashing in this category is a very, very big issue and consumers are extremely savvy about it. So where brands make claims that are either only partially true or are kind of sweeping generalizations, consumers are becoming increasingly savvy to that. And it's a real cause of frustration for them because they want to do the right thing, but as brands, we're not making it very easy for them. You know, our claims are often contradictory. The way one brand talks about plastic is entirely different to how another brand does. We're, we're looking for like little snippets of, of information that we can give consumers and, and often what we do is end up confusing them. So understanding is the biggest area that as marketeers we need to work on. Linked to that is trust. So there is um, a real, particularly with big businesses, a real lack of trust on behalf of consumers and they feel like they have to really explore and research some of the claims that the brands are making. Price and availability kind of go together for me. So on the one hand, what we're seeing here is in this research, we had more than 60% of consumers telling us that they're willing to pay up to 10% more for a more eco-friendly product. And that was across multiple categories. What they're also telling us though, is that both price and availability can also be limiting factors. One of their really big frustrations is going to a small store where the range might be more limited and not finding any eco-friendly option. So I think one of the things that we've been talking to, to other audiences on this research is, as brands, we've got to stop thinking about eco-friendly products being one of our niche variants or something that sits on the side of the brand as an option for those people that want it. And really what consumers are saying is, I want that to become the mainstream. So wherever my choice is limited, I should always be able to find a more eco-friendly, a more sustainable option. Um, at a price that I can afford on an everyday basis. A couple more charts and then, then I'm really happy to, to take some questions or we can open up a bit of a discussion. Um, we asked a bit about brands and businesses and 
another big piece of data here, 83% of our consumers or of our participants say that big brands and businesses are not doing enough to help the environment. And I think for anyone in the audience that's running a small business, um, you probably know this, but small business is absolutely the kind of the place to be in this space at the moment, because I think what consumers are finding is that the big brands are making big promises, but often that's with a longer time frame. And I think rationally, lots of us understand why, you know, those are big businesses that have to re-engineer supply chains. They're like giant tankers that have to be redirected and shifted. And what small businesses are able to do is to come through with products that are more eco-friendly, more sustainable by design, you know, from the get-go. That's how that they are established and how they've been designed um, right from the start. And they come with honesty, authenticity, trust, um they come you know they're much more kind of relatable for a lot of a lot of consumers so i think from a consumer point of view there's a real palpable frustration um with big brands you know they feel like the value action gap is actually now sitting with the big brands um who say they want to do the right thing but from a consumer point of view they're not acting fast enough or deep enough or more holistically um, or holistically enough um, so lots of great quotes from consumers, this kind of thing. If a small independent brand can use eco-friendly packaging, how can big brands not afford to? Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a real sense, like I say, from consumers of frustration and disappointment that big brands aren't, aren't taking a bigger lead and a more tangible lead. Um, they feel like they're making more sort of little step changes while small businesses are coming straight through. Um, with you know design solutions so as I've said here smaller brands are satisfying the hunger with disruptive radical innovations designed to be more eco-friendly um, so I think you know anyone like I say running who's just running a small business on this call is it's a really really good place to be um, in terms of what consumers really want from brands and businesses then so you know they're telling us that brands and businesses aren't doing enough what do they really want? And I think there's three areas here that, that all of us working in marketing need to really pay attention to. That first one is um, at a practical level, plastic is the biggest issue that consumers are focused on at the moment. So in terms of how they judge and evaluate different brand options, um, plastic is one of the biggest at the moment. And I think Partly that's because the media have done a really good job on focusing that. So um, War on Plastic, Blue Planet, et cetera. There's been a lot of really big focus over the last couple of years. Secondly, I think it's something that for consumers is really tangible. So you can see plastic in your home, in your shopping basket. You can see it in all the different products that we're buying. So when it comes to them satisfying that desire to do something, reducing the amount of plastic that they buy, reducing the amount of plastic that they're carrying out to recycle um, is a really tangible way, way of doing that. So I think, you know, brands are doing a lot of work there. I think that's the place to really carry on working at the moment is how do we reduce the amount of plastic in our products? How do we reduce the amount of wastage? How do we help consumers do that? And part of that goes back to that piece around understanding. So really helping consumers understand about virgin plastic, recycled plastic, um, and really asking questions of, of the brands that we buy. You know, what are you doing to reduce the amount of plastic that you use and what kind of plastic do you use? Um, and is it recyclable? You know, again, a lot of consumers don't even know whether, you know, plastic or certain types of plastic are recyclable or not. So there's a huge piece there about education. And my big urge to brand owners is to try and find consistency in our information, because when we compete with claims and we try and outsmart each other and use sustainability as a source of competitive advantage and outwit each other actually all we're doing is really frustrating consumers and making it very very difficult for them to decipher information um, across multiple categories so that's a sort of advice then would be you know really focus on plastic really focus on consistent information um, and then my last point on here was I think consumers are finding this quite a lonely journey. So a lot of what they're having to do is work this out for themselves. You know, it's pick products up, it's compare them, it's research them, it's read. 
Um, and that's a big ask for them. Um, and also, especially, you know, if you're being told what you do doesn't really matter, then it's kind of quite a lonely, demotivating journey. So I think my last kind of point on this is the more that we as brands can do to encourage consumers to make positive choices, to facilitate that and to really celebrate them and motivate them, um, the better. So I've seen some great examples of brands that have, you know, impact trackers, you know, this month you've helped us save this, um, this month, you know, you've, you've you know, saved this much plastic from going into the oceans, etc. Those kind of things, I think, are really motivating for consumers. It, I think it gives them some encouragement that what they're doing actually does make a difference and is worthwhile. Um, and I think the more, you know, the more that we can do that, the better. Um, so I think I'm going to stop talking there. And I was, like I said, I'm really happy to take questions if anybody either wants to to pop them in the chat and I, and I can respond have we got five minutes George to do that if I stop sharing hey guys if you've got any questions for Hillary uh, now's a good opportunity to take them uh, just pop them in the chat and Hillary will happily take questions for you if you if you have any uh, obviously she's put quite a lot of work in this case study and uh, knows a lot about this topic so you do feel free to ask her any questions if you have any so we found the consumers automatically assume com compostable packaging is better but it's not always the case did you find that as well um I can absolutely understand why, why consumers think that. Um, and I agree, I think one of the areas that I find most frustrating on behalf of consumers is deciphering this whole thing around kind of packaging. Um, and like I said, you know, the different grades of plastic, virgin plastic, compostable, bioplastics, et cetera. Um, so yes, we did. We did find that that's, that's, that that's the case. And I think it's, it's a really big challenge, you know, how, how do we help consumers understand something that is evolving really quickly um, and that isn't always kind of clear to, you know, to the experts either. Um, and I think in sustainable marketing, it's a big challenge, you know, taking really complex issues and describing them in a way that doesn't oversimplify them, doesn't treat consumers like an idiot, um, yet helps them quickly understand and decipher information. And one of the things I'd really love to see, like I said, is brands coming together to use common language, common visuals, you know, without creating, you know, multiple certifications, because those in themselves just add layers of communication. But, you know, if we could see all of the big brands agreeing on, you know, the key priorities, the best types of plastics, the best types of packaging, and all singing from the same hymn sheet, I think it would make it so much easier for consumers um, to understand. How do indie brands... Ask, I'm, Hillary, I'm going to answer this question if you don't mind. This one here. Uh, uh, in, Brendan, in answer to your question, yeah. uh, I would advise getting in touch with Kate Hills at Make It British. Um, <clears throat> she's a really great innovator in this field. She knows all the manufacturers, all the, in the you know, the, the ethical practices. She runs a event, I think it's called Make It British Live, where she pulls together a lot of the brands we're talking about, explains, you know, good practice in this, in this field. So if you haven't reached out to Kate Hills, I definitely recommend, I mean, she is at, do that. at the forefront of this movement. And uh, okay. uh, I, over to Hilary to finish off if you want, if you've got anything to add on that, Hilary. Yeah, I was also just gonna say um, on the back of this study, um, the brands that I mentioned, there's four brands are looking to do more and more in partnership as well. One of the things we're, we're thinking about doing is, is create, trying to create some common visuals, some common materials. Um, what we've done, I'll put the name of it on here as well, Earth Shakers marketing hub we've just created a group literally last week oh I didn't spell that right one sec earth shakers um on linkedin if anybody wants to join that group then please do um it's purely intended to be a place where we can share questions share resources share data um and you know make things freely available for to to, to, to work on together to come together in partnership etc so you know yeah join in um, okay, just one other question about trust certifications. I would be, yes, they are. They trust are really, you know, they can be really expensive for small businesses. Is there any place where affordable certification can be found? I've got really mixed feelings about certification, um, which is probably a controversial point of view, but I worry about how valuable they are to consumers right now. So we, as part of this study, we did, you'll see it in the deck, we did a piece of work asking how many of these are you aware of and which do you look for when it comes to shopping? 
and both were really low. Um, so I think often it depends on the category. That is, is the honest truth. I think it depends on the category as to whether certification is really valued in your category and really important to the particular consumers in your category. But I've seen brands where they're peppered with certifications and I think all that does for consumers is create loads of noise. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it doesn't really answer the question. It doesn't create a, che a cheaper certification, but I guess I would just, I'm questioning if that's the best place to put a limited marketing budget. Um, yeah, I agree, Lisa. Yeah, it's, it's really confusing. And, you know, like I say, we've, I've, I've worked with one client where if they wanted to, they could about put, could put about five or six certifications on their packs. And like I say, for a consumer, they don't even notice that. They just don't even notice it. And um, it just becomes kind of noise. So it's tricky. Like, you know, I don't want to do them a disservice because I think in some categories and people like Fair Trade have done a really, really good job for a long time um, in generating awareness in that space. But I think it's we just have to be careful about what we're trying to do with certification and, and whether, like I say, in your category, it's it's a really important, really valued one. Um, do I have a link to small green business? Uh, is that is that somebody? So Lisa, are you wanting to connect with small businesses? Just pop on there. I know we've only got a few minutes left, so just pop on there. What what do you mean by that? So Brett, Brendan was recommending something. He, he said small green. Oh, business. sorry. Yeah, it's an, I'm sorry. It's I didn't read that. Read above. Oh, good. Saying if you got Brilliant. a link to that, so she can Brilliant. look into it. That's what it was. Oh, Brett. Well, and I don't know that one, Brendan. So thank you for that. I'm going to look it up as well. <laughs> Awards for consumers. I think it. I think it depends who it's from, and um, what your brand is, and. And kind of what the purpose is um you know so i think some awards are great in terms of bringing credibility um you know it it it, it, it all depends on kind of who the award's coming from and what it's for and what your category is so um i think you know like any of these things look at the opportunity evaluate how much it's going to cost you to enter because often they have quite big price tags with them um look at you know what do you need to do to qualify look at if anyone else in your category has it already um, and, and decide if it's a bit of a personal decision, that one. I, I think, you know, I've seen stuff like, you know, awards from which or good housekeeping, depending on this, you know, some of those I'm just thinking because they're just a particular client of mine has them and they've been quite useful, but because that's in their category, they're really valued by the customers in that category um, and they carry a lot of status and a lot, a lot of weight. Um, but yeah, a bit like certifications, I think you've got to work out how much does it cost, how much time will it take you, and, and what weight will it carry for you in your in your overall kind of marketing mix. Any more questions, guys? I've only got probably two or three more minutes to get any last questions in it before we end the session. Impact trackers. Um, Heather, are you thinking impact trackers like the one I was talking about where you know, people, people kind of see what's happened and they can see, measure their impact. Um, the one I've worked with, the client actually developed it, developed it themselves. Um, so I don't know if there's software, but there's a couple of things in my head. Pop, Heather, pop your um, email in the chat for me. I need to go away and remember it because I was reading about two the other day. Um, they might be quite carbon trust focused. But, um, rather, Heather at Love Logs, Brill. They might be quite carbon footprint focused, but let me dig it out and I'll ping you a message. I'm going to answer your question, Brendan, about mainstream media. Obviously, I've been running publishers for years, so I can ask this one. Um, I'm going to give you my, my email address, Brendan, if you, want to, if you want to get in touch with me. Yeah? Um, I can definitely help you with this one for sure. Uh, but I mean, to summarise, <clears throat> um, there's 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 a few ways of doing it. One is 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 contacting people directly. So like, for example, contacting Gramercy directly and saying, hey, tell, you know, here's what we do. Um, the other way is to use the journal link hashtag on Twitter, which is quite common. And actually, surprisingly, you can get some pretty good stuff on there. I mean, I know brands that we work with that have won, got on BBC television using journal link and hashtags. Like, they, um, some amazing stuff has come out of journal link. Um, and also, you use press distribution services, most of which are actually quite low cost. So, like, for example, um, you've got journal link. Um, sorry, yeah, yeah journal link, you've got. Um, Gorkana, that's another one. 
there's the briefly app which is actually a new app but they're, they're, they're kind of going to come up soon um and there's one more press plugs that's it pressplugs.com or the code uk but you, you have to just and you have to just put yourself in all those different areas you know the the, the combination of approaching people directly with using the hashtags with using the distribution services and kind of just picking up and responding to whatever comes through um, but if you do want me to give you a call brendan um do bang me an email over and uh i will happily help you because obviously I, this is what i do so i can help with my own mute you. george you're not no uh, you're not me oh but i I've, I've got nothing but praise for gramercy because um uh, loran uh, did a story recently that I got from a link from Journalink. So uh, I understand exactly what you're saying, but it does seem like, uh, you know, in Cumbria, we are very, very far away from anywhere. Um, and it seems like in the in the pandemic, we're even further away from anywhere. And, you know, we see a lot of stuff that's very Southeast based. And it seems like, you know, journalists just go, oh, that's in Tunbridge Wells. It's an awful long way away. And then they go, that's in Cumbria. Oh, that's a different country. You know, they just, just don't do anything. But if you if you look on gramercy.com, you'll find that the latest story is about all about us. So, yeah, exactly. I've just realised who you are now. You, yeah. you, you have the Stonecraft company, isn't it? In, yeah, up in Coniston Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. District, yeah. <clears throat> uh, give, give me an email. I will I'll, do, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. give you a call and I'll help you with it, yeah? yeah. All right? Yeah, that's well, uh, Two minutes, guys. Quick last question. We've got to wrap it up really quick. <laughs> no. I just saw um, Kiana's response to Heather. Thank you for that, adding that in as well. I'm going to have a look at them. I love these calls. You come away always with, with Lord, you know, more, more tips and contacts. And, and that's in this space, that's what it's all about. It's just trying to navigate our way through it, I think, all of us. Been very good, Hilary. Very good indeed. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, you just want well. to say, uh, Hilary, you're actually, you're actually amazing today. So, seriously, I mean, I'm, I'm so gl gl glad that we did this to you. Uh, you. You just, you've absolutely nailed this one. So, it's been a real pleasure. I hope everyone feels the same way. I'm going to end it here, but I just want to say thank you very much for checking into this event. Um, I found it really insightful. hope everyone's learned something and made some great contacts. Our next one's going to be a, a, a branding and design workshop. And after that, we're actually doing an investment event with a VC firm called True Retail. That'll be taking place. So anyone that's fundraising in late March, early April, make sure you get to that. That's going to be a really, really good one. So uh, I'll be in touch with announcements about that very soon. So... Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.